Australian researchers have begun testing one of the world's most ancient remedies in a bid to prove once and for all whether it's a miracle cure or just quackery. Emu oil was first used by Australia's Aborigines as a tribal medicine and it is still used worldwide hundreds of years later. But there's no scientific proof that it actually works. Today it's used worldwide in treating ailments such as rheumatoid arthritis. It's been hailed as an aphrodisiac, a miracle cure for cancer and for aging. Read the literature and there's probably nothing that a good dose of emu oil won't fix. But it's all just anecdotal evidence. No scientific proof at all that emu oil actually works. A team of researchers at Australia's Adelaide Women's and Children's Hospital has been studying emu oil in a bid to determine once and for all whether it's all it's cracked up to be. Led by Dr. Tony Ferrante, they've conducted extensive mouse trials and they're about to embark on human clinical trials using emu oil to treat rheumatoid arthritis. But knowing whether it works or not is only half the battle. Researchers need to identify exactly what the mystery component is that makes emu oil effective in relieving inflammation. Fifty-seven-year-old Robert Veers isn't concerned with the know-how. He's had chronic arthritis in his back and finger joints for many years and was on the verge of giving up work. A few years ago, Beers threw away his pharmaceuticals and now takes only emu oil. He says it's perfect. You can feel the effects straight away. In Australia and the United States, the medicinal benefits of emu oil cannot be advertised unless there's scientific proof that it works. And worldwide, a multi-million dollar emu industry hangs in the balance until modern science can come up with the good oil on an ancient remedy. Only a lack of anaesthetics delayed the treatment of Sadia, a 32-year-old brown bear originally from northern Iraq. The bear was nicknamed Boo Boo, and according to zoo manager and veterinary doctor Adil Salman, the bear would undergo surgery once the zoo had received the results of a laboratory test. Salman said that a British and South African animal care body provided the zoo with anaesthetics needed to diagnose the tumour in the brown bear that was also blind. The sample of the tumour was taken and sent to laboratories for diagnosis. The zoo and animals suffered during the war in Iraq. When the city fell, soldiers fled, leaving weapons and live ammunition spilling from overturned army trucks. Looters swarmed in, pried open cages to steal animals, especially exotic birds. Those too large or vicious to steal or eat, including the lions, were freed to prowl the streets. Those still locked in their cages were left without food or water. Today, the cages house some 48 animals. Though fairly new and one of the region's finest, the zoo was built according to 18th century standards and much work still needs to be done to improve conditions for the animals. These two baby camels born at Berlin Zoo were born actually one week apart from each other. 
the older Rudy and his younger half-brother Rebel are no doubt this zoo's biggest attraction. The two foals are a little unsteady on their long legs and their semi-developed humps look rather droopily as skin flaps on their sides. The keeper says those are fat humps, meaning they store fat in them, which the youngsters have to build up first. In the womb, young camels get everything they need, but they also store fat. With mother milk and enough good food, they will be able to build up enough fat so they can have humps in at least six weeks. Rudy and Rebel already live with their mothers in a herd. Their father Roy is not part of the herd yet, since male camels tend to be a bit boisterous with their offsprings. Mikesh is a black and white house cat weighing in at 18.5 kilograms. That's about six times the weight of cats his age. Mikesh is so bloated from his poor diet that he is incapable of normal tasks. Veterinarians say it can be called cruelty to animals. It's a problem for the joints, for the heart circulation. Mikesh can't clean itself anymore because it is much too fat and had to have its back shaved because it could no longer keep it clean. Bikesh walks three to four steps and then is completely exhausted because his heart no longer works properly and he can't breathe normally. He was brought to the shelter after his owner was taken to state care for the elderly and will be put on a strict diet to reduce his weight. A cat should receive about 300 grams of food a day. This cat received two kilos of steak tartare every day. Mikesh won't make it to the Guinness Book of World Records. A spokesman for Guinness Book of Records said they don't keep track of fat cats any longer, but said the existing record was 18.55 kilograms. And that was a cat from Minnesota named O.T. Residents of Pariyaman Regency, one of the coconut growing areas in West Sumatra province, train pigtailed macaques, locally known as bedocks, to help pick coconuts during harvest time. Easily distinguished by its short tail, the pigtailed macaque is of stocky build with creamy brown fur on the back, white underparts, and dark brown fur on the crown. The owner of these macaques rents his trained barracks to residents during harvest time that usually runs every two months throughout the year. Training takes between two to three weeks for the monkeys to become adept at climbing trees, plucking the coconuts and throwing them on the grounds for humans to collect. These clever monkeys are also trained to obey direction from their owners in choosing a ripe coconut. Saya Harudin, who has been training and renting monkeys for over 20 years, charges around 40,000 rupiah per tree for the services of his monkeys. He feeds them cooked rice, bananas and two eggs a day to keep them fit. Tailed macaque species range from eastern India to most of mainland Southeast Asia to Sumatra and Borneo Islands. They are in great demand in Southeast Asia for coconut picking. <music> Le 
Lifeguards in Rio de Janeiro told bathers to leave sharks alone after three who strayed near the beach were killed following a suspected attack. Local authorities have said that a number of people were killing sharks on the beach after a young swimmer had been bitten on the right hand near the famous Copacabana Beach, supposedly by a shark. If true, it would have been the first shark attack near Rio for many years. It was said a mob of bathers clubbed and stabbed a pregnant female shark to death in shallow waters. The shark was about two meters long, the largest of three that were killed. Both local officials and animal rights activists warned bathers to stay away from the sharks, saying the attacks were neither safe for bathers nor for the animals. Lifeguards had to intensify patrols at the beach. Only 11 shark attacks have been recorded in Rio in the past 30 to 40 years. The world's first artificially conceived dolphins were born in Hong Kong. It marks a major step in efforts to reduce inbreeding in captivity and preserve endangered dolphin species. One of the calves was born to mother dolphin Ada in the pool waters of Hong Kong's Ocean Park. Neither of the artificially conceived calves, one female, one male, had been named. Mothers Ada and Gina, both bottlenose dolphins, made history when they became the world's first dolphins to be successfully inseminated artificially. Using ultrasound, scientists from Hong Kong's Polytechnic University, the territory's Ocean Park Aquarium and SeaWorld in the United States were able to accurately predict ovulation in dolphins for the first time. Dolphins have very irregular ovulation cycles, making artificial insemination exceptionally difficult. And past attempts in the United States had failed. The head of the 12-year-old project, Fiona Brook, said the calves have been keeping close by their mothers, and the marine park was very pleased with the calves. Scientists in Hong Kong now want to experiment with artificial insemination using sperm that has been frozen, which could further enlarge the genetic pool. San Diego Zoo's giant male panda calf, Bei Xing, received his weekly veterinary examination, but his size is beginning to make it less clear who's in charge here. According to veterinarian Lee Young, the young cub is developing well and becoming more vigorous and energetic with every passing week. So it's going to get progressively harder to do the exams. It's going to be bigger, stronger, have more teeth and basically won't want to be told where to go or what to do. Mei Sheng weighs 16.3 pounds and is only two feet long. Not bad for a panda that's only four and a half months old. The growing cub lives with his mum, Bei Yun, dad, Gao Gao, and half-sister, Hua Mi. And this family represents the largest giant panda captive population in the United States. A dating service for dogs. As strange as it sounds, it's basically what dog owners in India can now resort to when failing to find suitable mates for their pooches. 
The idea for this website comes from a dog lover from India's northwestern city of Jaipur. Biren Sharma founded the matchmaking and dating website which enables owners across India to register their dog's pedigrees and details free of charge in the hope of locating a suitable match. The first of its kind in India, the website attracted a huge number of dog enthusiasts seeking love for their lonesome pets. Viran Sharma is so impressed by his own success that he is already considering expansion into consultancy services for breeding techniques and even as far as offering psychiatric and physical health care. The site's biggest accomplishment so far was to find matches for rare, foreign and expensive breeds so that owners can maintain pure pedigree. So with all the positive feedback, it seems that times are over for the lonely dogs of India. More than 2,000 equestrian fans came to watch the traditional horse and sled races in Bavaria's picturesque town of Rotagagan. The race has been held on an 800 meter track on a field outside the town every year since 1966. Rules regarding which kinds of horses may enter the race and what kinds of sleds are allowed are very strict and based on the old traditions. Only Oberland, Haflinger and Pony breeds may take part. More importantly, the horse may not be driven with the persuasion of a riding crop. Historically, Bavaria was a very rural area and horses played a large role in the economy. Before cars and snow plows were invented, sleds were the most reliable method of transportation in the winter. Working horses pulled sleds of hay, wood, bread and people in order to earn their keep on the farms. Today, the races are fun for everyone, and the winners in each class are awarded with an original cowbell and a ribbon of silk. The burrow often associated with stubbornness and many times underappreciated as a workhorse, has never really received its due. But for over 40 years, the people of the small town of Otamba, Mexico, have recognized and paid homage to the animal for its hard work and endurance in the fields with the Festival of the Burrow. The Burrow Celebration Day began with a polo match, on burrows, of course, between two local teams, the participants played with broomsticks, knocking about an oversized plastic ball. Next, to the delight of the gathered crowd, came the wild burrow rides, which left most contestants on the ground. The final and most popular event of the day, the parade, was characterized by burrows in costume. Several asses were dressed up as popular Mexican personalities, such as President Fox and Subcommandant Bacos. The animal is a popular and idiosyncratic figure in everyday Mexican life. It often appears in editorial cartoons characterizing Mexicans themselves. Otumba 
located 60 kilometers northeast of Mexico City, has approximately 10,000 inhabitants who devote themselves to agriculture and commerce. The Velibit Refuge for Bear Cubs was founded in the village of Kutarevo in 2002. Huddled in the rough woodlands of Croatia's Mount Velibit, the refuge cares for bear cubs which have become separated from their mothers. Aside from death caused by vehicles, illegal hunters are the main cause of bear deaths and so the barbed wire fence which encloses the orphan's pen in the refuge is not for the purpose of protecting the mountain villagers from the brown bears inside, but rather to provide added protection for the bears against humans. The four cubs, sheltering in what their carers say is the Balkans' only bear orphanage, are too young to cause harm and are already so used to humans they can't go back to the wild. Their only chance of survival is to be raised by humans. Although there are other bear refuges in Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey and Greece, they give refuge to abused or maltreated adult bears, usually confiscated from street performers. Kutarevo Orphanage currently looks after Janja, Munjo, Zadravi and Lujabo. The smallest of all four, Lujabo, was starving and barely alive when locals found him. He has since recovered and now spends most of his time playing with Zadrave, another cub. Zanja is the only female in the bunch and much less interested in humans unless they bring food, which is mostly fruit, bread and grass harvested from the nearby river. Munjo was the first to arrive. He's at ease with people and loves playing with them. Brown bears are the largest wild animals living in Croatia. They have no natural enemies, except man. <laughs> 